All right, my name is Aaron Rhodes, and you're listening to the Shuttlecock Podcast. We are sponsored by the Vinyl Underground at 7th Heaven, offering new and used vinyl at 76 and Troost in Kansas City, Missouri. This week on the show, we have Michelle Bacon. What's up? Hey, how's it going? Good, good. So um, I guess we'll start where I usually start. Um, I'm just kind of interested what kind of music like you were introduced to and what you were listening to when you were growing up. Okay, um... Yeah, so I started out, I learned piano when I was like four years old, so, and my folks are not really big music people, so I kind of just had to find it myself, and it took me a long time, Um, so like, yeah, when I was a little kid, I just listened to a lot of classical music and stuff like that. Um, As I got into high school and college, you know, I made a lot of friends that were listening to things that would later become influential to me, like Radiohead and the Pixies and stuff like that, so... um, it really took it took quite a while for me to just find a lot of, you know, like Zeppelin and all that classic rock kind of stuff. Um, it took yeah, it took me up until like probably college, and I'm still discovering a lot of stuff. You know, mm-hmm. but so I guess you would say that like a lot of your like base knowledge of music is kind of based in like like 80s and 90s, like alternative and indie rock Probably stuff. more alternative indie rock kind of stuff, um, like classic rock. I'm, I mean, it's not really something that I am into anymore, but it's it was kind of like the jumping off point for me, I think. Mm. So you were saying that you learned like piano and like classical stuff as a kid. So did that, tra- like, was that some of the, did you end up like performing a lot of that music or was that basically just like like lessons and that kind of thing? Um, I did a lot of recitals, so I took the Suzuki method of piano, which is, like, ear training, pretty much. Um, I did that from, like, the ages of 4 to 12, and I did a lot of piano recitals and stuff like that. Um, and then I kind of I kind of picked up guitar and drums for a minute when I was a kid, but then I didn't do anything with it until later on in life, so, mm-hmm. yeah. And then, but you have been, you play bass in, like, you bass have played bass in several bands, so... Yeah. Bass and drums mainly is what I do now. Um, I didn't really start playing until, like, probably after college, I guess. Mm. And um, so you've played in, like, you're not active in more than, like, a couple bands right now, but you have played in bands like the Philistines and Mm -hmm. Deco Auto and, like, a bunch of pretty notable, like, 2000s, 2010s, like, Kansas City rock bands. Yeah. So what was, like, your first jump into like kind of the indie rock scene in Kansas City? Um, so I started playing in a band with my best friend, John, um, in like, I think 2007 or 2008. Um, we had a band called Mock Rocket 3000. It was actually a pretty ridiculous thing. Uh, we dressed up, they dressed up in superhero costumes, like John, his cousin Robert. Um, and it was more of a, like Robert was really influenced by like ACDC and stuff like that. So it was definitely more of a um, classic rock kind of guitar rock kind of thing. Um, so that was my first band. And then we made another band a couple of years later called Straight Ups. Um, and we had a bass player named Tracy Flowers, and she's actually in Deco Auto. So Deco Auto maybe was my first real foray into the scene, like playing more shows and getting more exposed to other local bands and that was like I think 2010 when I started playing with them maybe Mm -hmm. um and then from there I really just kind of developed into a full-time musician Mm -hmm. and I guess after you play in like a couple bands that get attention like you probably do just end up fielding a lot of like new band requests and that type of thing and Mm -hmm. so but you were kind of were you like like at least part of your income was just from playing in like several bands at once a little bit mm. yeah um yeah because I'd started playing drums in Deco Auto and then I joined another band called Dolls on Fire which used to be a band called The Threes um and I think uh the Straight Ups had played with them a couple times so so like I kind of learned to play bass through that band as well um and I was making some money but really a lot of it was just doing it to get the experience to play with different people and learn different styles. Mm -hmm. And, um, I know like, well, so like one of, one of the two bands you're playing in, like you're playing in 
um, the David Bowie tribute band right now and with Heidi Lynn Gluck. But I was kind of curious, like, because those are, you know, you're playing other people's songs m- mostly in those two acts. So is there, like, a band that you played in previously that you really got to, like, channel a lot of your, like, songwriting into the most? Uh, like, not really. Um, I've I've written some songs on my own, and I've never really done anything with them. Mm-hmm. Um, I've found that I've just been better at supporting people. Um, it's just kind of what I like to do. Mm-hmm. And maybe part of it's just, like, I'm not ready to put my songs out there or something. But, um, like, I try to put my musical influences in to whatever I'm playing, if it fits for the songs. But... But yeah, I mean, I I kind of see myself more in that support role, mm. and I I just enjoy doing that. Where Where do you think is there like a certain direction you would see like your own songs going in if you had the chance to develop them at some point? Um, you know, it really depends on what I'm into at the moment, mm. and like right now, I've been I've been listening to a lot of like Saint Vincent and stuff like that. Lucy Dacus, new newer artists that I've been listening to a lot, which those are pretty different styles. Like St. Vincent is kind of everywhere, you know? Um, so I don't, I don't really know what I would do and I'm not, not quite ready to do anything with my own songs yet, but, um, I think maybe one of these days, you know, but Mm. it'll probably just depend on what I'm listening to at the moment. Yeah. And, um, so yeah. So how, how far back do you go with, uh, Heidi and like, when did you start playing Um, with her? I've just been playing with her for a, a little, little bit over a year, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. And you, you just kind of know her from, like, being hit up to just play with the her? Scene. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she had hit me up to play a show with her um, at, at the Lawrence Art Center, like, in January of last year. And then, you know, we just started playing together. And I think she liked, she liked playing with me. And I really enjoy her and her band. And it's a fairly new band, Um She's been, she's done a lot of stuff solo, and she's had different people come in. But but like within the last year, we've really developed well together mm. as a band. So oh yeah, and it always is kind of like she and she has a long history of like playing music in Kansas City also. So mm. like I think it always is interesting to see what happens when like a songwriter brings in like a whole new group of people because I think you know you can count several different people who have done that over mm-hmm. the years whether like you're thinking of like Taryn and your friend like she I think she's gone through like a couple of sets of people and yeah. then I guess Heidi like w- mm-hmm. like are were you really familiar with like the kind of pre like the other incarnations of her bands before not really I had seen her um with her other bands a couple times I think they played at the tank room a few times um mainly they play in Lawrence so I didn't really see him um but yeah I I think that you know I think for anybody just having a steady group of three or four people in in a band just kind of helps the direction of where you're going and you know we've all been playing in this band now for about a year I, I think I was the newest addition to the band um but I think it's just it's grown a lot you know just as far as us working together you know and so are are you are you guys mostly playing like stuff that hasn't come out yet together or are you kind of taking on some of her other like catalog stuff? It's mostly stuff that she's already put out. Mm-hmm. Um I know she's been working on some new stuff and we played a couple of those songs, but she had talked about maybe releasing a single this year and I'm not sure when that's happening, but but yeah, I mean, I I love working with her. She's one of the best songwriters I've ever worked with. Um, even before I started playing with her, you know, I, I think I rated her album, like my favorite Casey Lawrence area album of the year, 2016. So, so I, it's really great for me to be able to work with her. Mm. And like you say, you're taking on a bunch of her like past songs. Like, would you say that there's like a shift or like, kind of the sound on those songs like being tweaked a little from the records like is there like a certain direction you see it like kind of moving um the a lot of the music seems like it's gotten bigger I mean like I you know if you've listened to her stuff it's it's fairly low-key um like the beauty of her songwriting is just within her lyrics and just the way just the, the dynamics of everything and I feel like you know this particular band we've 
been able to really work with those dynamics, and especially in a live setting. Um, her guitar player, her name's Jade Rose. She's just, she like builds her own pedals and guitars and stuff like that, and she's just really got this great mind for what what the sound should be, and like it translates over really well in the live setting. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, you, you're also playing in uh, the the band that fell to earth, the the David Bowie tribute band, yeah. and that came together like shortly after he died in 2016. Yeah, it actually came together. Um, I had started planning it before he died. Oh wow! Yeah, um, I think I announced it like in December of 2015, and you know, for me, it was just like I love David Bowie, and you know, I wanted to work with some of these awesome musicians in Kansas City so I was like I'll just put this thing together at Knuckleheads no big deal whatever and then he passed away like three weeks before the show um and so it ended up moving to the Uptown Theater and uh it's also a charity benefit that first year we gave 10 percent of the proceeds to Midwest Music Foundation um and you know people wanted it to keep going so we just have made an annual thing uh we just did our third annual one back in january and i'm kind of looking to expand it now just because you know it's it's a really great group of people and we've gotten really good response and we've been able to give a lot of money to different charities um so like we want to take it on the road you know just maybe to lawrence and maybe out to like st louis springfield you know just pretty close regional places mm. um so we're doing that but we're pretty much going to keep the kansas city show to each year so next january we're actually planning on doing uh a weekend of it nice and no yeah i am kind of curious though since like you'd always already like brought everyone together before he passed away mm -hmm. like what were like the first reactions and like how was everyone feeling like after that happened uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was a crazy feeling. Um, we actually had, I had a rehearsal scheduled for the, that day. Like he passed away. I think it, it was like, I got a bunch of texts from people at like 1am. So like we had rehearsal the next day and we all got there and, and we already had most of the songs fairly worked out, you know? So it was just kind of like, we're just kind of all sitting around like staring at each other. Like this is crazy, you know? Um, it was obviously really sad and it was a really cathartic experience just just play those songs for that first time that first rehearsal and just for the next three weeks you know like it also put it puts more pressure on us because we're like well you know we really have to do we have to do these songs really well and and again like these are some of the best musicians I've ever known you know um so I wasn't worried that they would not do them well but it's just like you know when you're doing a tribute show, it's it's kind of different than, like, if you're just playing a bunch of covers, or at least in my mind, you know? Mm. It's like, you really have to nail those songs. You have to be... Because people are going to be coming to that show to see those songs kind of resurrected, and, and you're not really putting your own spin on them, you know? You're just kind of honoring them. Um, so we, you know, we try to do that as best as possible, and I think, I think we've achieved it. Mm. And yes, but were there any like really direct changes that you made to like maybe the set list or just any aspect of the show after he passed away? Uh, not really. Mm. Um, we kept we kept the set list. Um, I think we had considered changing up a couple things around. Oh, we did add we added under pressure. I think like at the very last moment, um, we just thought like that would just be a really good ending song, just because you know it was. It was going to be a really emotional night for a lot of people. Um, so we didn't want to end it on, you know, like rock and roll suicide or something like that. Yeah. So, so yeah, like ending, choosing to end it on Under Pressure was really cool because people were just like, people were really happy when they were leaving the place. Like I remember somebody posted something on my Twitter about how happy they were. Like they saw everybody clapping and snapping as they left the venue and everybody's just smiling and and that's what we wanted you know we wanted to unite everybody around this music and around this artist that was so important to so many people mm. and but yeah also like what what kind of drew you to his music and like made you want to do the band in the first place 
Um, so, like I was saying, you know, I didn't get into a lot of music until college, probably. Uh, Bowie was one of those first artists I could remember being really influential to me. Um, probably, I think it was, I don't know, high school or college, but I got into, you know, somebody showed me Ziggy Stardust. And I played that album over and over so many times. And then I just gradually started getting into more of his work and realizing how different it was. Um, and even, you know, when we were choosing the set list, it was just like, oh, man, we're really, you know, we're borrowing from so many different genres because he he just he took the best out of everything and made it his own. And that was the thing about him that I think so many people were drawn to just like his sense of weirdness and being able to just mold these things and make them commercially viable. Mm. Um, and, and just being like that alien, that outcast kind of thing. And I, that's just something that I've always related with. Mm. And what was the process of putting the band together like? Um, Is that something that you kind of like spearheaded yourself? Or, yeah, or? I, it started uh, with me and my friend Stephanie Williams. She plays drums in Katie Gee and then the girls. I think we were just hanging out one night and we wanted to play music together. So I was like, hey, we should do this. Um, from there, I kind of just started talking to a couple people that I knew were Bowie fans that I wanted to work with. And it kind of just metastasized from there. Um, Steve Tulipana from the record bar. I... I didn't really know him at the time, so I was just like, I'll just send him a note and see if he wants to sing a couple songs. And he was like, I'll sing all of them if you want. So, like, all right, that's awesome. And, you know, he's become he's become a good friend um, since I started doing all this. Like, he's just, he's got such a great mind for business. And, you know, he's been playing music in this town for, I don't know, a really long time. Yeah. So he knows he knows what's going on. He's great he's just a great person to work with. Um, and it's been, it's just been really great to have him. Like he's the one that got us, um, into the uptown, you know, like I got a call from knucklehead saying that we wouldn't be able to do the show there or we wouldn't be able to have as many people at the show as we thought, um, because we had sold out one of the rooms and, you know, like it was 48 hours before that show. So I called Steve and, like an hour later he calls and he's like don't worry we got the uptown so all right cool you know so it's great just having these really awesome musicians who are also really professional as well mm. and so do you guys end up doing kind of like a unique set every year like does a lot change in between the shows yeah um we let's see like i think we did 26 songs this year or something um we tried to do i think between seven and ten new songs and just kind of cycle things in and out. Mm. Um, next year, we're hoping to, like I said, we're hopefully going to do a weekend, like Friday and Saturday or something like that, um, and probably have two different sets just for each night. Um, and we all, like, we still periodically get together throughout the year just so we're not coming up at, like, November and, like, oh, man, we need to start practicing. So it's, it's nice to just keep us, like, keep our chops up and really just to get together and hang out. Mm -hmm. And so when when you're not playing music, you're often writing about it also. you um, I know you have, like, some previous experience in, like, writing and editing before you got to do this, but I think you kind of started off doing music writing at Inc. I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I started at Inc. Like, man, it's been, like, 10 years since mm -hmm. I did that. Um, but, yeah, that's where I first started doing music reviews um gradually from there i i started doing the delhi kc which was an online magazine uh based in new york originally and i did the kansas city chapter um and i did that for three or four years i mm -hmm. think um and then started working at 90.9 the bridge and that's where i'm at now mm. well what were some of those first articles like when you were doing ink like when like since you started doing ink um well, they par probably weren't very good, <laughs> but um, I was doing a lot of, uh, I was doing more national reviews, and then I started doing a couple, I only did a few local reviews, like at the time I wasn't really plugged into the scene, I didn't know anybody in it, um, so that was actually a really good doorway into the scene, because the, I can remember 
um, I reviewed Antennas Up and Atlantic Fade Out and a few bands that are not around anymore, but that was a really good introduction for me into the scene, I think. Mm. And so then at what point did you end up um, starting to work with uh, the Delhi? Um, I think, I want to say it was 2012 or 13. So I volunteer with Midwest Music Foundation and they were down in Austin. They do um, Midcoast Takeover, which is an unofficial showcase down at South by. Um, so they were approached by the deli. Um, and so, like I said, they were based in New York. They were approached by the editor. Um, I think they, they voted mid coast takeover, one of their top unofficial showcases down there or something. And so they asked Rhonda Lyon, who's, uh, the executive director of MMF, if, they want to start a like a music magazine from Kansas City, so she asked me if I wanted to do it, and that's how I got involved. Mm. And so, yeah, what was a lot of the the coverage on on that site like, and what kind of like voice did it take on? Would you say um, it was all all for local bands or local regional, mostly Kansas City, Lawrence area bands. Um, really, I did a lot of I, I had a volunteer staff of about it fluctuated between like five to ten people depending on their time commitments um a lot of album reviews just profiles on bands and i really tried to uh take more of a journalistic approach with it um instead of like a blog kind of thing just because that's kind of the school i came from um so like i edited everything for ap style and stuff like that but but like for me it was just a lot about profiling bands especially the ones that weren't getting noticed. You know, it's it's a lot like what you do now, which I think is really great for the scene because it's like, you know, you have people like Tim Finn and Bill Brownlee, like people that work at the Star, and they're they're profiling those bigger bands and even those bigger Kansas City bands. And then, you know, it's just like the next tier, and not to say anything bad about those bands, but just the fact that they're not as known yet, you know, or ju- they're just starting to get their name out there. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, thank you for that. But um, like, would like I think like any like editor can like kind of cop to this at some point. But like, do you think like wh- what would you call like some of like the Delhi Casey's bands? Like you know, like kind of the ones that you champion the most and like yeah. like pushed hard to like kind of get some exposure for. Um. Well, I remember Radke being one of our early bands that we had pushed. Um, so the Delhi, the national magazine, they had like a poll that they would have us do every year, which I'm not really into that because I don't like rating bands. But like, so Radke won the first year and that was before they were really doing much of it. I think they had maybe just started touring at that point. Um, and then the year after that, they were they had exploded, you know. Um, so they were one of the really early bands that we had championed. Um, I think Not A Planet, Me Like Bees, they were bands that we had learned about pretty early on, uh, Katie Gian and the Girls. Um, I can't really remember now, but mm. but those were some of the earlier bands, I think. But, you know, like, I tried to make it a pretty all-encompassing thing, mm. um, and there was... Yeah, there was just a whole lot of content for, in the beginning at least. Yeah, so. and I think like I think I remember. I don't know if it was just like an online feature or if it was like a printed thing. But Radke was on like some kind of cover for something that the Daily yeah, did. Yeah, I think it was that poll that we did, the okay, year end yeah. poll, um, and we had, had they won it, so they were probably like the had like a cover photo on the mm-hmm. web website or something like that. Do you do you still follow them pretty closely? Um, Even if you're not, like, not as much, mm. they're not doing they're not doing one in Kansas City anymore. Um, I kind of decided that I would end that. I think it was like was it three years ago? I don't know. I think maybe it's two, uh, whenever it was. But um, they decided they didn't want to keep Kansas City really on it. Um, kind of had some issues with them because we would kind of go back and forth between. Um, so it was me and this New York editor, and he would be like, "Well, there's." probably not a lot of good bands in Kansas City kind of thing because you're a small town. Like, well, I mean, we don't have as many bands, but that, you know, doesn't mean they're bad. just Mm. means that you don't know about them yet kind of thing. So there was kind of a back and forth. 
And so, so yeah, we just decided it would be best for us not to do anything with Kansas City anymore. Mm. And so since uh, the Kansas City chapter of it ended uh, a few years ago, like, um, so have you kind of just – do you still end up doing a lot of ink stuff or – Not really not so anymore. So it's mostly your 90.9 Pretty much stuff. at the bridge, yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, like, I'm sure, like, as an editor of a magazine like that, well, the, the site before, like, you know, you probably had a little more to do and there's a little more pressure on you from – like other people in the company, like is it a bit, a little bit like of a relief to just like be working and just kind of getting to pick out the occasional stuff? Yeah, 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 it's it's actually better. Yeah, I felt like I think when I first started doing the deli, I put a lot of pressure on myself just to like make sure there was content out there every day, and you know, as you know, it's a lot. It's a lot of work, and you know, I had volunteers helping out, but they were all in bands too or they all had day jobs or whatnot so it was hard to have like a continual commitment from anybody which I totally understood Mm. um so it's been nice it's been nice working at the bridge just because I feel like I can focus in a little bit more and not just try not to worry about like oh I'm not including this band or this band or this band um instead just like I'll do what I can but yeah not have to worry about every single day I guess mm. how, how did you first get kind of connected with the the people at the bridge um so I started uh freelancing for them a couple of years ago I think I had just met John Hart um who was the station manager I met him at a show or something that one of my bands was probably playing and he had asked me if I wanted to do like an article a week on uh local bands mm. and so I've been doing that for two years now um I started working actually at the bridge um about a year about a year ago I think now Mm -hmm. and so now I do like most of their web content and writing e-blasts and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and um so what what kind of um like what have been some of your favorite like features and interviews and stuff you've got to do through that site um man I've I've been able to do a lot actually I I think my very first one was with Yes You Are and their band that I I really enjoy I haven't actually gotten to see them in a long time but they were my first interview and I really I really liked them um oh yeah and they like um I I've, I've only been able to listen to like uh, some of their stuff but like they they're they, I, I feel like they're kind of taking the place that maybe like beautiful bodies had like five years yeah. ago or something so yeah yeah, That's totally. Kind of an interesting dynamic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like the fresh pop kind of thing mm-hmm. going on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, man, yeah, I, I think I wrote some on Beautiful Bodies back in the deli too. That mm. was fun. Um, man, I can't, I can't really remember. Uh, Victor and Penny, I've done a couple things with them. Um, it's, go ahead. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. And I know uh, your most recent feature was on Maria the Mexican. Yeah, I did something on them today, actually. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, what's what kind of went into that article? What do you like really focus on there? Um, I was focused more on their relationship with their so Maria and Tess Cuevas, they're the two sisters that started the band. Um, so their grandmother was uh, the co founder of one of the first all female mariachi bands mm-hmm. in the country. Um, so that was kind of my jumping off point. Um, Lately, I've been wanting to do more features on women and just, you know, underrepresented musicians, and which, again, you do a really great job of that. Um, so, so like, they were one of the bands that I wanted to talk to, and it just worked out that they had a show tonight and I think next week, too. So, yeah, that's why I chose them for this week. But, but yeah, I mean, I think it's really important for those stories to be told, you know. Mm-hmm. And... Um... So is there anything that you're, like, kind of scoping out right now that you might want to feature on the bridge, like stuff that your people can kind of be looking for from you coming up? Um, well, I like I said, I want to do something on women in music. I'm kind of developing a series, but I don't really know how what shape that's going to take yet. Um, kind of just kind of talking to different people. Um, this kind of came about because I was talking to somebody about just, like, being a female musician and 
the weird comments that you hear from people, and they're not always intentionally bad, but they'll just leave a bad taste in your mouth or something. So, so like I, I wanted to build something around that, and and just kind of with like the Me Too movement and Times Up, it it just seems like it's something that would be important to talk about right now. Mm. So, oh yeah, and it's always like yeah, I I know what you mean by like like kind of offhand stuff like that kind of just equates to like someone just like kind of othering you and that yeah. kind of stuff so yeah yeah totally. and I, I yeah i do my best not to just like it's like oh so you're a woman in a band like yeah right. let's yeah. like who hasn't asked that before yeah. and what kind of answer are you going to get exactly right. but um yeah so i was kind of wondering like you know i i have like kind of my own motives and i'm sure everyone else does but like i was curious what personally makes you so like motivated to keep focusing on specifically Kansas City musicians in your work? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I think for me, a lot of it's just being a musician and seeing how, I don't want to say how much of a struggle it is because, you know, we're we're playing music, it it could be way worse. But, you know, there's just, there's a lot of music in the world. There's, you know, with the internet age, you can find anything anywhere. And while that's an awesome thing, it's also really difficult to break through just because there's so much happening everywhere so so like for me I I feel like I I have some skills so I can hopefully help artists tell their story and maybe that'll help be a jumping off point for them to get booked at a certain club or get on a certain festival or get attention from a bigger media outlet or something like that Mm so so I'm just you know, trying to do what I can to help advocate and use the skills I have to do that. Mm -hmm. And I guess that kind of leads into um, another project you mentioned that you were working on is you're about to start a media and PR company that's focusing on like regional musicians. Mm -hmm. Um, What, what's your main idea behind that and what kind of inspired you to make that jump? Yeah. So I've been kind of doing some freelance stuff for bands for the past few years, just like consulting and social media and writing press releases and bios and stuff like that. So, so really it's just a way of making that a little bit more official. Um, and I've got professional experience from past lives from, for just like being a project manager and editor and published writer and stuff. So, so again, it's just a matter of me trying to use those skills to help other people out. Um, and yeah, so this company, it's going to be called Tiger Mom Productions because I'm a little bit of a tiger mom. Um, but again, uh, I, I know a lot of musicians, I've worked with a lot of great musicians, but I think that a lot of, a lot of working musicians just don't have that skill set, and, and just because it's maybe something they never got a chance to develop, um, and that's why, you know, there's some great organizations like MMF. Um, they'll advocate for musicians. They will help bring like different uh, seminars and workshops so artists can learn more about the business side of things. And Artist Inc. is another great program that I went through um, through Mid America Arts Alliance last year. And another, it just helps like uh, give you those tools. Um, so so yeah, it's it's something that I want to do just to kind of help help facilitate that for artists. Mm. And is, is there, like, a certain, like, type of, like, like certain genres or, like, certain, like, anything that would distinguish someone that you'd want to work with the most? Um, I'm definitely not limited in genres. You know, it's whatever. Um, right now I'm kind of still laying the groundwork for it. Um, I hope to expand it to include other people as well. Like, I've, I've got a lot of great contacts in video production, photography, and stuff like that. So I want to be able to offer those services as well. But, yeah, just starting out, you know, like I think I think there are a lot of artists that don't know where to even start. Like, how do I book my first show? Or how do I get this radio station to play my single? Or how do I build a press kit or something like that? And that's kind of where I want to start, you know. Um, I've been in a few touring bands. I've been in a few... Uh, just local bands trying to make it throughout Kansas City. Um, and I have a pretty good uh, database of press contacts as well. So 
so yeah, again, I just want to use those. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not limited to genre, you know, it's just really what, depending on what you're looking for, then I, I'll try to help you if I can. Awesome. And, um, yeah, is there anything else you're, you're working on right now that people should know about? Uh, not really. Just kind of laying the groundwork for this production company. And, yeah, I put out weekly articles on the bridge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, people can follow us at Shuttlecock Mag on Facebook, Twitter, and, and Instagram. They can visit shuttlecockmusic.com for the articles. There's shellcockmag.bigcartel for dot bigcartel dot com for t-shirts, zines, and buttons, and we have a couple shows that we're presenting coming up that you can find on f- our Facebook page. And where can people find you online, Michelle? Um, well, I, my stuff's on the Bridges website, so check out bridge nine zero nine dot org for that. Um, I will be launching a website for. Tiger Mom Productions within the next couple months. So just look out for that. Yeah. Is there any social media people should follow you on? Um, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Michelle O. Bacon. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you being on the show this week. Yeah, thanks for having me, Aaron. Yeah, no problem.